this is good. All right, everything is going smooth. Awesome. We're good to go then. Hello there. Enviro boy, this is my channel. And uh yeah, it's Labor Day. It's a holiday, which uh means I got all kinds of free time to just like sit here and goof around and chat with all y'all guys, which is fun and rad and cool and stuff. <laughs> um yeah, I hope everyone's having uh, well, okay, so I hope everyone who gets to celebrate Labor Day is having a good long weekend. Um, I hope everyone else it's at least a tolerable weekend. I know. I always feel like Labor Day is one of those uh, one of those holidays that's like very good at making some people feel bitter <laughs> about the holiday because some people like me get the day off from our day jobs and it's wonderful and relaxing and then other people don't and it's like stupid considering that the idea of Labor Day is that it's to celebrate all of the people that labor for us, right? Like, the idea is the idea is to celebrate that. So it's like, I don't know, I always feel like I'd be pretty bitter if it's like, okay, on the day in which we as a culture set aside to celebrate those who work, you get to work! Hooray! So, I don't know. If you, if you had to work at any point this week, then sorry, I hope it wasn't that awful for you. Uh, yeah. Anywho, let's go ahead and uh, get into it here. There we go. All right, all right, all right. Man, I look like I jumped out of a pool. I did nothing to, like, I had a day off, so I did nothing to, like, make myself look composed at all today. My hair just looks sad and disappointing right now. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. All right, so today, today for our writing... We need to go ahead and get ourselves going on a uh, on a dungeon and stuff. So fun stuff, super fun stuff. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess the thing that I want to open with is I spent this weekend kind of playing around with my templates and just sort of thinking in general about how um, how I go about organizing dungeons. And um, I actually took the time to ask my players for some very specific feedback about things they, uh, about what they like. Because they're, they're always, my players have always been very uh, complimentary towards my style of DMing, which is really appreciative. But sometimes it's hard because I, you know, when they're, when they're appreciative and all they do is they say like, no, it's great, we love it. It's hard for me because I'm someone who always likes to improve what I'm doing. Um, and so I, I made it a point to ask my players, hey, what about my stuff is your favorite? What types of elements do you really enjoy? What types of elements would you prefer to see more of? And all of that kind of stuff. And based on their um, feedback, I kind of took some time to rethink how I go about um, how I go about uh, organizing and building and preparing a dungeon. Um, and <laughs> What, what I gathered from them and so and now, now here's another instance I said this all the time with like economy and money based things in D&D &D, but um, here's another thing that I, I uh, in instance here talking about building a dungeon that I feel it's really important for me to really emphasize the idea of your mileage may vary um, every group is going to like different things within a game and that is okay um Every DM is going to like to present different things, and that is okay. So when I'm sitting here talking about my approach to building things, to building dungeons, to organizing a dungeon, and everything like that, it is by far not me trying to claim that my approach is the definitive approach. Um, there are dozens of different ways to go about, excuse me, building a campaign, building a dungeon, building anything homebrew. There are millions of different ways to go about it, and the important aspect is no matter where you start, like if you're homebrewing and making a dungeon, no matter where you start, as you go, talk with your players, with your group. Talk with them. Figure out what they like, what they don't like. Give them more of what they like. Give them less of what they don't like. 
and keep doing that, you know, and and constant and and don't just do it once and assume that it's always great, right? Because as players go through a campaign and as they experience different things, they might find something that they're like, oh, actually, I kind of want this. Can we add a bit more of this? Or you know, this was fun at first, but now it's getting kind of repetitive. Can we take that element away? So never assume that what I put on here you know for my streams never assume that my approach is the best approach um, and never assume that there is ever one consistent best approach for any group really um, it is 100% possible that any group will fluctuate in what it likes it doesn't like <sighs> excuse me so just you know I guess I guess I don't need to carry the rant on any for any further just just always keep that in mind just always keep that in mind right do the the one thing that I would say that I am doing that I would encourage everyone to always do is like I say talk to your players talk to them figure out what they like and what they don't like um, and just like I'm saying I did you know I talked to my players and said hey what do you really like and you know they didn't they weren't willing to tell me anything they didn't like which I am you know I trust my players and my friends enough to know that that means that there wasn't anything they were disappointed in they didn't dislike anything I was doing which of course made me feel really good but you know there's there's always still things that you can do better um, you know and it's like always striving to find that one little bit better you know recognizing that there's no perfect and that what was better one month might be not better in a couple months as their moods and attitudes and desires change so just always keep that dialogue alive with your players is, is really what I'm getting at keep that dialogue alive um, and what brought this whole rant on is the fact that I kept the dialogue alive and so I modified um, some of the stuff that I've been, uh, I, I modified my template basically for myself, um, for I, I, for how I organize and design a dungeon, based on what they wanted. Because basically, what my friends expressed to me is they really like dungeons that have a very game mechanic approach to them, in the sense of they all they're all big video gamers so they absolutely adore the process of meticulously room by room clearing out a dungeon finding all of the rewards and treasures that are in a dungeon and killing all of the enemies that are in it so based on that feedback with my players um, I've kind of gathered that they really like when I present them with stuff that feels very you know mega dungeon you know mad mage type of stuff like they really like those approaches and I thought to myself like okay well give them what they want give them what they want there's no reason there's no reason to to avoid that the only reason really to avoid that is if your players want something that feels less of a dungeon crawl and more of a natural role-playing uh, element but my players they really like dungeon crawls and well that works out for me because I love designing a good dungeon crawl I love designing a dungeon that is just absolutely chock full of all kinds of crap for them to just wade through and have to try and navigate and kill and loot and puzzles to solve and traps to disarm. I love giving them that stuff and if my players are into it then pff, hell, you know, win-win. Win-win for everybody. So, with that in mind, I I kind of rearranged my template. We have we still have my standard dungeon te template which is sort of the template that I've been using for for a long time now for how to organize a dungeon um, but based on the feedback from my players I made a second one and I call this one dungeon template Zelda style where it's basically I've made my dungeons even fuller of all kinds of crap and it feels much more like a standard Legend of Zelda you know Ocarina of Time Wind Waker fucking you know all of those classic Zelda dungeon crawls where there are specific items that you got to find and every room has like a danger every room has a has a reward and it's just a matter of systematically going through and finding all that stuff so I'm going to at least for this first dungeon that we're gonna make I'm gonna pivot and it's easy enough to do this because we haven't done anything yet we have like a placeholder here but we haven't done anything yet so I'm gonna go ahead and delete this delete that page and we're gonna take our Zelda template uh, we're going to copy this here, and then we want to paste that down there and make it a sub-page because it is a campaign element. And we're going to go ahead and make this uh, introductory dungeon uh, 
in the in the stylings of a Zelda type because fuck, that's what my players asked for and so that's what I'm gonna give. That's what I'm gonna give. You know, and again, that's not to say that every group is going to like that, nor is it going to mean that every dungeon that I make or that anyone makes in this style is going to be a good one. It's just simply a product of me listening to my players and them saying, hey, this is what we really like. This is what we want. They were basically like, yeah, we love big dungeons as long as there's plenty of treasure in them. And I'm like sitting here thinking to myself, I can do that. I can do that. Never thought of having a template for all the stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Uh, orange, orange pulp. I like that. I like that. Orange pulp. I, uh... <laughs> That was 100% like it was an epiphany moment for me when I thought to make myself templates of how I do these things. Because it was, I was finding myself constantly reverting, like I, like there was, there was a day, it was a couple years ago, when I like, I made a dungeon that was really good and I really liked it. It felt very complete. Hey, Gift of Gabby, how's it going? Um, and I, I made this dungeon and I was really proud of it and had all of the elements that I wanted in it. I ran it for my friends and it felt good. And so then for like a month, as I was writing more stuff, I was constantly referring back to that one. Like remembering like, okay, what else did I put in there? Oh yeah, I put this thing in there and I really like to have that thing. And then it clicked to me. I was like, I should just make like an empty format of this that I can just do fill in the blanks essentially. So that's what I did. That's what I did. And it was, uh, it was one of the best decisions of my life because I've done it for dungeons. You can see I've got my templates all up here. You know, I've got... Uh, We've got one for like an overarching territory. We've got them for shops for if I'm just designing a specific mission or a walkthrough of a mission. And we got them for dungeons. And if we go to my other sections here, I have templates for all the stuff that goes in all of these other tabs too. And it's it's 100% been one of the best investments of my life <laughs> to do it this way. So, but yeah, so. The first thing that I want to do for this dungeon, so so we we finished off basically all of our background information for our world here, um, for our for our campaign setting, um, and in fact I'm gonna pull up um, our map for it because we're gonna have to start adding a couple extra things here and there. Um, so here's our here's our map of the area. Um, and it's uh, it's been a minute since we've really done much with this, um, but we have our uh, we we have our area here, our region, and I want to I want to just make a small um, a small edit to this, which is to add the location of where this first mission is going to happen. So the first mission of this campaign takes place at our forward base. For I guess I guess it's been a while since we've really talked about what the overarching campaign well it hasn't been too long because we kind of remodified it a little bit but I'll just give the cliff notes of what the campaign we're designing here is um, we're designing a campaign where basically um, the story of it is we have a okay yeah, yeah I'm gonna pull up now we're now we're really getting into it I'm gonna pull up the world map yeah that was yeah believe it or not that was not the world map that was just one part of it <laughs> so here is our world map here all right and we are playing a campaign uh, within just this hex right here. Uh, this hex alone is where this campaign takes place. And basically the story of it is, so in this world, right, we have a world that was ripped apart by, um, by it was called, it's called the Unhinging. Uh, it's basically a, ca a, you know, worldwide catastrophe type event where reality got ripped asunder and monsters and stuff came out. You know, the usual fantasy fair. Um... <laughs> And so the world's kind of in this situation where we only have a few um, stronghold cities scattered around. And it is very dangerous and very long to travel them because we have one guarded highway essentially that connects all cities. So, you know, trade within cities exists, but it is a long, arduous process uh, that is also very dangerous. So what's happened is our city of Fusvik up here has decided to begin an initiative to build a road that goes from here down to here. Uh, it has made it roughly this far, and we find ourselves around here. What the campaign is basically is the players are part of the expedition crew that go on this 
and it has met a roadblock of a dragon who is sort of the lord of this whole region down here who's all not all that stoked about humans going through here because he's like I've I've read the books of what humans do to environments when they're there well humans humanoids really um but you get what the fuck I'm saying um you know there's like all it's he's like I've seen what you guys do you tend to destroy environments and lands and do whatever you want to build your cities I don't want you here get out and basically the campaign is the players either trying to convince the dragon uh, no, you should let us do this because we'll be cool this time. Or if the players choose, they can just like work on getting stronger to eventually kill the dragon. Um, but either way, essentially they're trying to bypass this dragon for the sake of building a trade route. Um, which is a pretty, you know, I, I personally think that's a pretty compelling thing, having that trade route. It's not compelling to the players in the sense of like, okay, but what kind of treasure am I going to get here? But that's what the purpose of designing the dungeons is for so at any rate that's our overall campaign um we've gotten our baseline we've built our baseline city up here we've described all of the different shops and everything that take that that exist in there we've given them inventories and everything we've talked about all of the random encounters that can happen while they're just traveling through any parts of this world and we've talked about the other various factions that exist in this region we have our um we have our drow up here we have our durgar down here and we have our giants up here um, so we've built the background information and now we have to build the campaign uh, and what better place to start than with the first uh, first encounter or the first uh, dungeon or cave they're going to go through and that first cave or that first dungeon is going to be a cave right here at the forward base basically what we're going to start up forward base being the how far this uh, excursion to build a pathway has gotten so far um, so we're going to start them off simply because this campaign is intended to be one that begins at level uh, zero. Uh, not level zero, level one, but kind of level zero. It's meant to be, it's meant to be, uh, um, it's meant to be sort of a, uh, a, uh, a, a, an introductory campaign for new players. Um, uh, if they, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you have a group of new people, um, so what I want to do is I want to start it off nice and simply with a little cave that they can explore that actually really isn't related to the campaign. It just gives them an excuse to be adventuring, finding a little bit of gold, and doing something fun without there being a time pressure quite yet. So that's here. I'm trying to take a break from planning. It's not going well. Too, oh, too excited as in like you're, you're too like excited and distractible to try and write. Is that what you're trying to say? I get that feeling. I know that feeling. That sort of analysis paralysis. There's so much stuff to do. You don't know where to go. I think that's what you're trying to say. Or I could be completely misinterpreting you and putting words in your mouth. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? It's real. It's, it's just really a toss up. <laughs> so what I want to do really quickly is I just want to put in a little marker for our cave here. Because we're just going to have them exploring a cave. Basically what this is going to open up in. The campaign opens up with them. The players all being part of this. Uh, this crew that's doing this excursion um, and the the forward base has come across a small cave that needs uh, exploring and clearing out um, because they need to know whether or not this cave is going to be a, a distraction or a bother for the the road because if it's a safe if, if it's Essentially, they're looking to see if there's a tear in reality, because that's what the unhinging did. There's all kinds of tears between the different mortal and uh, ethereal and elemental planes and all that kind of stuff. There's tears like that all across the world, and so they're they're trying to navigate um, a safe pathway that avoids all of those types of things. So basically, this cave here is meant to be um, um, is is meant to be a a. a uh, or, or rather it's a potential place where there could be a tear and so they need to explore and as long as there's nothing there then it's like hey you know we can go ahead and keep the pathway going here because it seems safe in every other way curse of strad planning <laughs> yeah curse of strad is curse of strad is something curse of strad is awesome um but it is a uh 
it is a complex campaign, that is for sure. I, I don't think anyone can blame you for struggling to sort of figure out and keep your thoughts straight on that one all the time. Love Curse of Strahd, but yeah, it's complex. It's complex, there's no doubt about that. There's a lot to think about, always. Um, so we've got a little cave going on here, and I'm going to... I'm not even going to put a label on this cave, to be perfectly honest. Um... Because it's just, it's it's not a location, it's not like anything, it's just a cave to, again, give the players an excuse for something to do. You know, like I say, I like opening up, especially if it's a level 1, if it's a campaign that starts at level 1, I like opening up with something like this that really isn't all that complicated um, as far as story goes. So that way, if you have a bunch of new players, or even experienced players just trying to get used to a new character, right? If they're playing some character that they've never played before, you know, that's a class they've never that they've never played before, then it's uh, it's going to be a challenge for them to be smooth with it. So this having sort of just this this um, this this cave that's unrelated to anything, so they can just basically play with their characters, get used to them, and level up once so that way once they start dealing with story based stuff they're like okay we got our feet wet we understand how our characters are going and we've got fun new stuff to play with it's perfect um so because that's the first big module you've run yeah yeah if it's the first big one you've run um then yeah it's definitely going to be complicated the thing there's a certain irony too when it comes to uh when it comes to pre-made modules too i find them honestly to be a bit more work than a homebrew to run like obviously a homebrew is more work to prepare but to actually run them I find pre-mades to be even more work because when it's a homebrew thing I have intimate knowledge of everything that exists in this area and it is very easy to ad lib and yes and your way through whatever your players come up with um, with a module it's harder to feel confident doing that unless you memorize the entire book because you don't, like, at least for me, I don't want to step on the toes of what's presented there. Um, namely, because if I, if I accidentally confuse things, that can disrupt, it can disrupt the, uh, the way the, the, the campaign goes. Um, you know, because then it's like, oh, shoot, I've just interrupted and I've ruined the entire pre-made campaign. And then you're in homebrew, except you're in the middle of the campaign, so you got to start really making stuff up on the fly. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, so it's all I, I find them I find them to be almost more of a challenge, uh, in that sense. Um, but uh, <laughs> harder to plan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the other thing about it too is everyone's everyone's got different strengths. So some people are going to naturally uh, naturally have an easier time with this, that, or the other thing. Um, and yeah, I just it's it's definitely more time commitment and and I would say more work to do this. But. Um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's also more fun for me. I like doing it that way. I don't understand how I don't understand how auto mod works with some of these things. Well, we can allow the word put. I don't. That's it's a weird one. Whatever. <laughs> Too scared to fuck up pre-made. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, orange pulp. That's like that's kind of my go-to when it comes to. Uh, when it comes to uh, to modules, yeah, no, I don't know, I don't know what's up with Auto Mod. It's learning and getting better, but sometimes it comes up with something. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, Auto Mod? It's weird. Um, but yeah, no, I'm with you. That's that's usually what I'll do. I I like to, if if I have um, if I have players that want to play a module, usually what I'll say is like, okay, I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do it like a that module plus, which is basically. I take what the module exists, I'll copy and paste it in, into a, a region in my world, and then I'll fill in the blanks for what I like to have. Um, so, that's uh, that's that's usually my approach too. So, I have 14 pages of planning for Curse of Strahd. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot of work, that's a lot of work, that's for sure. Let's see, the next campaign is going to be under dark for characters. Out of the Abyss, yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. So, yeah, I tend to, I don't even tend to take things explicitly from what module if I don't have to. And instead, I'll just take elements from modules and plop them where they're useful for me. Um, I love using modules for uh, inspiration, but I rarely use them as written. I rarely do that. Um, 
So let's see here. So we're, we're just plopping our little cave down there. Um, and what I'd like to do first, actually, is I'd like to just take a minute and have some fun making a little map here. Um, it's always a fun place to start for me. Let's see here. Bagman is your religion. I'll hail Bagman. I have no I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Um, but good for you, Werepigsaur. I'm I'm glad you're proud of your uh, glad you're glad you're proud of your religion. That's great. I don't I have, but I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> All right, let's start a new map here. Start a new map here. Okay, so one thing I've learned. So I use Dungeon Draft for making my maps. Um, and one thing I've learned uh, is that um, uh, is that while it has the cave brush, while it has the cave brush, it tends to make the program very unstable and it tends to crash a lot. So instead, I just take the time to make very jagged walls with the uh, with the wall tool or with the room tool. So we're gonna take our cave floor and then we'll just go with uh, stone walls here. Uh, it's here. Oh yeah, yeah. Out of the out of the abyss, having their their uh, environment section for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, like having little tools like that. Like I say, that's why I say I take, I get a lot of inspiration, um, from from pre-made modules. Uh, but then I don't always use them exactly as it is because there's just a bunch of really cool tools that I like to incorporate into the stuff that I'm creating and I'm writing. Um, so let's see. Okay, so I'm, we're just gonna make it here. And I like to make my dungeons. I, I basically every floor of a dungeon that I make. Sorry, I'm adjusting my my shorts because they're riding up on me, and I'm giving myself a wedgie here. But that's too much information, so I'm not going to say that out loud to you guys. Um, I like to make my dungeons uh, have ten rooms per floor, because um, that's a unless I have a specific reason to avoid that. Um, it does get a little predictable when all of my dungeons have 10 rooms per floor But honestly as long as you're creative about what goes in those rooms and as long as there's a compelling reason for players to do it I've never had players be upset about the fact that I'm pretty consistently using that that model for things um, So we're gonna make 10 rooms and we're just gonna start out by making just some random shape rooms and I really wish the cave uh, drawing tool worked a bit better um, because it just looks a bit more natural it's it's actually a, a very sharp looking excuse me a very sharp looking thing but it just it makes it so un, it makes it so so unstable and it crashes all the time hey Gandhi and how's it going um, and so I don't usually I'll deal with it because you just save a lot and then reload anytime it crashes but I don't want to do that on stream because I feel like that would just make me look really stupid and there's already plenty of stuff that makes me look stupid um, and I don't need to exacerbate that situation. So, so here we are, just kind of making random room sizes and stuff. And truth be told, it really doesn't matter exactly what the rooms look like, especially when we're doing a cave. We kind of want it to look random. All I, all I'm really going for is making sure I have ten rooms uh, by the time it's all said and done. So we do that. So there's four rooms like that. There we go, five rooms. Try to make the shapes a little varied and unpredictable if I can. Um, just because it makes it more interesting that way. There are six rooms. Um, there are seven rooms. That's, let's do it like that. Eight rooms. We can cram one right in here. Let's do it like that. Nine rooms, and then we'll just do like a nice big one over up here. There we go. All right, so there's 10 rooms. Simple enough. Uh, now we gotta connect them. So just given the location of the map and where I placed the uh, little marker on there, makes most sense that they would find that uh, the, the cave um, entrance kind of over here. So you just kind of, all you got to do is just make a random room and it'll automatically connect them, which is awesome. <laughs> Caves aren't sequential squares with straight highways. 
That's uh, what you're describing is a mine. Um, so they can. Even a mine wouldn't do that. I mean, it certainly would be convenient if they all were. It'd be so much easier to create those. Um, but, you know. So, yeah. So now we just kind of connect them randomly. And one thing that's kind of nice about doing it this way is you can just kind of add those random things and it makes them look kind of jagged and random that way so that they still kind of look cave-like. And my way of doing connecting the rooms is I basically just start with wherever I want the entrance to be and then whatever the closest room is I just kind of connect them you know like the closest rooms to each other right so it's like this room these rooms are pretty close to each other so well oops I gotta make sure I actually do it right though there we go and then we'll just go like that maybe there we go so you connect them up like that right and then this one's like really close to this one so we can make this like a small little offshoot do something like that and it's like we could connect all those but it kind of makes it more complex and interesting if you don't have all the rooms connect to each other and have like some fake pathways and stuff it just makes it feel a bit more you know actual random cave like as opposed to me trying too hard to make something exactly right now you can do that connect this one actually you know what? this one could be really interesting if we do it uh let's oh you know what check this out boom we do that there's a good connection right there right see it's a little odd and random and then we'll connect this one up to here there we go boom there's a cave although see i don't like necessarily how one singular track that is so i'm just going to add a small passage whoa whoops that's not how i wanted that to happen undo that did not expect it to treat it that way usually it doesn't do that that's weird um let me try let me just experiment see if it's gonna do all that no oh, see it didn't do it that time i don't know what the fuck it did that time but there we go so now we got a loop that's perfect bought a 20 pound weight vest last week oh hell yeah weight vests are awesome hiked a local hill 10 times one hour of elevation hell yeah man that's that's awesome that's some work go get it go get it that's rad that's rad good for you i took uh i took i had to take this morning off i uh was sparring pretty hard over saturday and sunday's my usual day off and usually i can uh recover well enough on sundays with the day off but today combining combined with it being a holiday um i i my legs are still very sore today so rather than killing them with the hill sprints that I would normally do. I decided to take an extra day off, um, especially because this coming weekend, I've actually got a training retreat. I'm uh, traveling to, I'm visiting a different gym and we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be training there. So I, uh, I, I wanna try and keep myself fresh there. I don't like, there we go. I didn't like that little jagged bit coming out there. So we'll just do that. Um, so yeah, I took today off and I'm feeling a little guilty and lazy for it, but you know, sometimes you gotta do that. Yeah, I bet they were stiff. I bet your calves were stiff. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, runs. That's one of the best things too. Like, once you kind of, once your body's generally in shape, uh, doing more workouts actually can help with soreness because it will loosen everything up. My soreness though is uh, mostly bruises from sparring, <laughs> so I decided to take an extra day off so I didn't like split my calves or anything like that, or split my shins open. <laughs> That's uh, that's one that you just gotta rest for. But here we go. So we got our we got our cave here set up. Um, and one thing that I'm gonna do, and this is just purely a mechanics thing. Actually, we're staying in here. We're gonna go to the portal tool. Purely a mechanics thing. Um, for uh, uh, for keeping um, what am I trying to say here? Like for for making our entrance act like a cave entrance. I just put doors all along the outside there because otherwise it'll treat the whole thing as enclosed. Um, and I don't like doing that. So, you know, there you go. The other thing that I'm going to do, and I've started doing this as a mechanics thing, is I'll just, I just put one light in the center of um, every, I put one, like, just a light source in the center of each room. And this is like a mechanics thing that works with, uh, particularly with Dungeon Draft and then uh, the Foundry virtual tabletop that I run my online games with. Um, I just put one light in each room like this because what it'll do is when I upload this onto the Foundry virtual tabletop, 
it'll bring all that light information and it uses that to determine people's like line of sight dark vision yada 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 all that kind of stuff and so if you put a light in every room like that um then you can still add whatever other lights you want but it will bring that light that data about there being a light into um into the the virtual tabletop and from in that interface you can turn these on and off so i'll put it in there and i'll turn them off but then it's a really handy thing especially when we're talking about um doing uh doing like a legend of zelda approach to things because what i can do is i can have a baseline have these all switched off but then i can put like a map item in in the dungeon for players to find right if we're going if we're going particularly game mechanic e of it you know or with with the dungeon then i can i can give them the map and when i give them the map you flick on all of these lights so suddenly even though it's a dark dank nasty cave the map gives them the privilege of like knowing what it looks like so it's a little it's very game mechanic y and it like is not a realistic thing um so if you're if your team like if your group of players is much more into a very authentic sort of like realistic i always got to put realistic in quotes because it's like realistic for wizards and archers shooting spells and shit at each other but you, you get what the fuck I'm saying. Like, if you're if your player's like a more, more human, realistic type of experience, you probably won't want to do this type of stuff. But for me and the way I run games, and the way my players like games, when you're in a dungeon, it's kind of like we're in an instance of you know World of Warcraft or something. It's like you've entered it, and they know. Okay, we are now in dungeon crawl mode, and so for them, it's like, it's like uh, I. You know, they, they've now entered it like we're heavily playing a game when we're in a dungeon. And then when they want that role play, more like realistic experience, you know, then they know that, okay, well, if that's what we want, we're going to wait until the next time we go to the city. And the cities are a much more free form, realistic. People are just chit chatting and how they go and stuff like that. And it doesn't mean that I don't incorporate game elements into other parts of the game, nor do I avoid incorporating realistic role play stuff into the dungeons it just means that the dungeons kind of flip that switch into like okay it's game mechanic skyrim we are going through and we're not leaving until we found every goddamn apple in a barrel that we can fucking find in this place right it's like and that's just how my players like to play and i'm all about giving that for them so gotta be careful bringing realism into a game of fantasy maybe <laughs> yeah yeah there's there's a lot of different lines that can be crossed when you start tiptoeing that that well that line <laughs> in a lot of different directions that it can take um and that for me children is why i always say unless you're really determined to play a game and you really have no one else to play do your damnedest to convince already existing friends to play D D with you because when you go online with a bunch of randos you have no idea who the fuck you're gonna end up playing with and they might have very different ideas about what types of realistic things they want to bring into this game. <laughs> and that can go in any direction. You know, that can go in any nightmare direction. It could include people that don't understand boundaries of what type of roleplay you're doing. It can be just people that are idiots and make characters that never actually want to work with a team. It's like, well, then why did you do this? But more of an is it cool, okay, let's do it type of DM, 100%. 100% me too. I am like, I am absolutely the DM that was like, usually what I'll do is I'll tell my players, I'll, I'll say to them, I'm like, okay, I'm going to leave it up to the, I'm going to leave it up to the, to the council here is what I'll call them. And I'll say rules as written says that I should do it this way. If you guys want to do it this other way, it would certainly be a lot more fun. And I am totally okay with that. And I'll basically give them the choice. It's like, I'll give them the, the rules as written, you know, how did the, how how does that turn out? And if they're like, no, we don't really like that, and I'm like, okay, then totally do it this way because it's way more fun. And and there's obviously a time and place for that. I don't do that where it's like, okay, uh, rules as written, uh, ru ru rules as like by, by group consensus. Yeah, exactly. I leave it up to them because it's like, but but there are time. There's like a time and place because it's like, I do that for things like, you know, when my players were level one. And they were still just kind of learning the game. 
and they got themselves in way over their heads and didn't really understand the concept of running away from a fight if necessary. And so one of their players, like, died, and it was, like, the way it would have happened. I was like, okay, so here's the situation. Rules as written, they have to do this or else they're dead forever. But if you guys would prefer, we can just say they're unconscious, they're stable but unconscious, and that's that, and you guys don't have to worry about them dying right away. And they were all like, yeah, let's, they were like, their, their attitude was like, yeah, okay, well, we'll bring it back and, yeah, you know, let, let's do no one dies, you know, in our, like, second session ever, but we'll we'll go back to it and maybe make things harsher later on. So it's like situations like that, I'll do it. I don't do it for situations like, okay, rules as written, you're supposed to take 12 damage, but if you only want to take 8, we can do that. No, it's like, fuck that shit. It's like, you do, that's the damage you take. But yeah, no, I, it's the way I always describe it to my players. I'm like, this is, this isn't my game. This is our game. So let's make sure that we're doing things in a way that all of us think is fun. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. No one wants to reroll a character on the first session, especially because with this group, that was their, that was most of their first time playing D&D ever. And I was like, I'm not going to fucking introduce them to D&D by killing all their characters. That's what Call of Cthulhu is for. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that in D&D. <laughs> Just seems like a dick move. But yeah, no. I'm a huge proponent of, like, rule of cool and give players the power to override the rules as written as long as everyone agrees that that's the better way to do it. And, and by leaving it up to council, that usually helps mitigate players intentionally breaking the game in their favor, too, because usually what will happen, like... If one player wants to be like, well, I, you know, maybe we could just play it so that I got the, f the killing blow, then everyone else is going to be, you know, because I'm playing with friends, all the rest of them are going to be like, shut the fuck up. No, that's not fair. So it's like they can kind of police each other pretty well, too. So that helps. But I don't know. The big thing is that's like a, like I say, the big thing is I highly encourage everyone to play with friends before you play with random online people. Because random online people. You never know what their interests are. You don't know what their goals for playing the game are. You don't know what their personality is. So it's just a minefield from the get-go. Whereas if you're playing with friends, even if there's varying ideas about what different players want to do, at the very least you know how to communicate with them and you know when they're being serious or you know you know that they're not assholes, they're your friends and, and all that stuff. It just helps ease a lot of those tensions that are just kind of there from the get-go if you play online. I don't know. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. That was, that was a real aside there. Let's go back to making a dungeon. I don't know. I don't even remember where that conversation came from. I'm going to put one extra light. Uh, oh, yeah. It was because I was talking about how I'm making my dungeons very game mechanic-y, um, which isn't really rules as written, but that's what my players like. So, fuck you. We're doing it that way. <laughs> I'm going to put one more light source right there because that's supposed to be the exit to the cave. Um, one last thing we're going to do really quickly here is I'm going to add a little text boxes. And this is 100% just for easy note taking, um, easy note taking and reference when running the dungeon. Go by rules as what's fun for 100%, 100%. Like that's what everyone should do. Like there's a time and place certainly to be a rules lawyer, but my opinion is the game should always be fun first and foremost, even if it breaks the rules. And the beauty of it is, if you read the, you know, if you read any of the booklets that Wizards puts out, they agree wholeheartedly because they always tell you, like, you know, change anything that you want to. You know, here's the rules. This is the way it's intended to play. But if your players want to do something different, do something different. Have fun. <laughs> it's definitely the way to do it. Whoops. Shoot. I should have clicked out of there. So, so I'm just labeling the rooms here. Um, and this, like I said, this is just pure, purely for reference, um, because it's going to be random, mostly random, what goes in, uh, what goes in what, um, room. It's just this way, when we start putting all the notes and the details about what's in each room in, uh, one note, we can just, like, ha label the rooms, and we can say in one note, room, one note, say room one has this, this, and this. So that's all these numbers are for. It doesn't matter if players can or can't see them, because like I say, it's going to be randomized, and we're going to keep our notes hidden from the players. So, so you've realized over the past years, it's getting back into D&D, &D, uh, just how malleable the rules are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, literally any aspect, can, aspect of the system could be hack modified to suit the table. 100%, 100%. And it's not surprising, actually, that Wizards would make that, because look at how Magic the Gathering works. Like, they have rules, 
and then every deck has like 15 fucking cards that break the rules of the own game, of it, of its own game. So it's like that's what they do, um, and I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant the the willingness to throw an audible for the sake of having fun, um, and that's why I think that D and D is especially fifth edition is receiving is, is seeing such a resurgence in popularity right now. Um, is because it makes it so easy for any group of people to turn it into the game that they want to play. Um, there's a lot of beauty in things like Pathfinder that are much more rigid and strict in how the rules work and how things work. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, and there's, and there's, I play in that and we have a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, but it's a different kind of fun to play that game. And if that's not your specific kind of fun, it's going to be hard to get into it. But with D&D, &D, like, they provide the rules so that you can be strict like that. But they provide all kinds of alternative approaches to things to just make it whatever you want to make it. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And I think that's why D&D &D really is so accessible to so many new players and why it ends up being sort of the gateway drug for most, most gamers to get into tabletops um, because of that. The concept of specific rule overrides general rule. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. Uh, especially for Magic the Gathering, for sure, for sure. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. I always think that's funny. I'm not even super into Magic, but I've got some friends that are, so I'll occasionally borrow a deck from one of them just to play when we're all hanging out because it's fun. And like mostly, I just sit there, look at the pretty pictures, and be like, I guess I'll do this and see if that works. And then usually I'll get stomped unless they're really nice to me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think it's I think it's a brilliant way, and I think it. I think it uh, understands, like it shows a strong awareness of the fact that it's a game, right? Like if there's a competition, you can't do that, you know? But when you're just sitting around with your group of friends, it's a game. Like turn it into just like fucking Calvin Ball it, right? And just make up rules as you go because it sounds fun. Like that's, that's what it should be. That's what it should be when you're just hanging around with your buds. And that's... Again, it comes back to that concept that I always say too. That's why I always say play with friends, not with strangers, right? Like, there's if you want to play with strangers, you can. You know, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's a wrong way to play, but it's like if it's your especially if it's your first time playing, don't play with random people online. Convince, do everything you have to do. Pull teeth, twist arms, break fingernails, you know, and convince your friends to just try it once, because usually you can find a way to to get just about any group of people to have fun with it. So, anywho, anywho, it's a fun conversation. I don't, I actually don't really mind getting off on tangents like that. I love being able to just sort of like sit and talk about the mechanics and philosophies of games and stuff like that. I think that's really fun. I think it's really fun. I think it's an underrated conversation topic, talking about how games influence us as individuals and even cultures at large. I don't know. I think it's a, I think it's a cool subject that gets overlooked a lot because it's considered childish to sit there and talk about games but the fact is is like humans humans are born playing games look at that's how we learn as children like human mammals play games L look at any puppy they make up games puppies they play with each other they rough house with each other games are integral to humans as humans for the asian torture method of bamboo slivers under fingernails to convince friends to play D, D. that's a good one that's a good one um that's a really good one. I personally take, I, I like to go big right from the get go and just go straight up flogging, uh, personally. But you know, every every group of friends responds differently. You know, that's what I've been talking about this whole time. Every group of friends responds differently. <laughs> oh boy. Anywho, casual torture aside, uh, I don't know if I'm comfortable having that on record. <laughs> Broken kneecaps? Ah, yes, yes. Absolutely. In fact, it, honestly, broken kneecaps really just kind of encourages it because they're not going to be able to do a whole lot else but sit around and play games. So there you go. <laughs> Plus, they'll remember the pain, so then you won't even have to break them in the future to keep them playing. You'll just have to threaten it. It'll be great. All right, so we've got our rough map here. So let's go ahead and save this real quick here. Um, let me just save this put it into the right area I'll put it over here um, uh, beginning cave is what we'll call it there all right just wanted to save that to make sure that we didn't lose anything so now let's go ahead let's go ahead so we're gonna step aside from that and now we're gonna go in here and here's where you guys can see so okay so we got we got some work to do we got to set the ground 
uh, the, the baseline information for this dungeon. It's going to be quick and easy. Um, PC gets punished with flogging water deep. <laughs> Player gets flogged in IRL instead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, see, Orange Pulp, at that point in time, you're basically LARPing. Um, and I don't fuck around with my LARPing. Fuck that nerf shit. All right, you get a real sword, a real shield, and you fight it out like like adults. Like, you, you get that shit going. <laughs> What's the lore behind this cave system? Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what we're going to start out with. Uh, uh, you're one step ahead of me. Look at you go. Um, so in my templates, uh, I have included in here um, the history section. And as you can see, um, I'm using, I started off talking about it in case anyone's dropping in. Um, I've kind of retooled and I've got sort of like based on um, based on feedback from my players uh, and they've said they really like the sort of dungeon crawl approach to doing dungeons even in D&D &D, and I'm like fuck that's fine I can do that that's easy that's fun to make um, and so because of their feedback uh, I've essentially uh, adopted my templates and made an alternative template that I'm calling the Zelda style um, Opan Zelda style and it's, uh, it's basically designed to feel a lot like how a Zelda dungeon works. I put in a map item that'll, that'll like, reveal the map. A compass that will, like, a compass that will reveal what prizes exist in different rooms of it. And all that kind of stuff. So that's what it means when it says Zelda, in case anyone's wondering there. Um, for our basics here, intended player level. Um, fi so I design all of my dungeons for five players. Um, because... I insist, as a DM, I insist on there being at the very least three players um, to have a session, but for doing a um, for, for doing a campaign, I insist on there being at least four players, but no more than six. Um, I do four to six, and that's just for me. Uh, if it's more than that, it just becomes too difficult for me to keep track of. Um, since I can't do this professionally, it's hard for me to keep track of six people and keep it interesting and fun for that many people in a session. Um, and fewer than that, it's hard for me to have anything that's properly balanced. Um, so it's like for one-offs, if a friend is playing and, you know, just coming, like a friend is in town and they wanted to play, we'll add them in there as a seventh player. Or if one or two people are sick or something like that, we'll still play with three. But as a general rule, that's what I do. And I designed them for five because that's just the middle thing there, so... As an aside, Gift Glyph uh, did a fantastic set of mechanics for both mapping out adventure as well as group challenges. There's a lot of really good stuff. And my approach to it, um, my approach to it, I can't remember exactly what the, what the Giffy Glyph um, approach was. Because I've read so many of them. Um, and, and my approach is basically me taking all of the parts that made sense to me and were my favorite. And turning them into my own personal style. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really, um, there's a lot of really good approaches to it. And that's why... I always say, take my approach, if you're watching me, take my approach with a grain of salt because my approach works for me as a DM and my players. And that's like, even when I'm designing this, while I do want to make this something that anyone could come in and see this stuff, and one of these days, I, I keep saying it, and I do mean it, one of these days I'm going to find a way to share this campaign. I'd like to. Um, uh, I, I, it's, um, I, I, I do want to share it. But even so, I'm designing this so that I can play it with my players later. Um, and so I'm designing it uh, with the knowledge of what they like. So always a grain of salt. Always a grain of salt. Um, so um, is it safe to post links? Um, I think I think bots are kind of... I don't know if I have anything specifically set up to a link. Um, what I would encourage you to do if you want to share that stuff, uh, Gandhian, is I have a Discord channel that we're, I'm trying to build like a network of all the people who like to share stuff, whether it's stuff they've made or stuff they've found uh, for D&D &D homebrewing. I've got a Discord. Uh, join that and share it there. Um, I've got all kinds of different chat rooms that it might be uh, relevant for in there. And uh, that's what I would encourage you to do. Because the other thing about it too, is if you put it there, it won't scroll out and be gone in five minutes and then disappear with, uh, with the end of the stream. You know, it'll, it'll always be available and it'll be available on the Discord. Um, for anyone else who comes along in the future too, so that's what I would encourage if you have a link. Um, <laughs> subtle plug for my own my own brand, <laughs> except everything that I do is free, so I'm not really selling anything. But um, yeah, that's what I would encourage. We've got it's a small group, but it's growing, uh, and people do share stuff, and I love when people share stuff. Um, you can find the link to my Discord uh, on my channel information. Uh, it exists there. Um, 
There's probably a way to find it in chat, but I don't know how it is, how to do that. Then, because I, I kind of actually suck at this. Done. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate it. Hell yeah! There we go. <laughs> Woo! I'm now. I'm basically famous now. We got two more people. No, it's like the Discord really isn't. I, I don't want it to be necessarily about me. I do use it for like announcements about my stream and stuff, but really I want it to be a network because people have such cool ideas that they present, dur especially during these writing streams. Yeah. And I just want, uh, I want that stuff to not just be gone once the stream is over, you know, because there's so many cool things that people share. And it's like, shit, man, I want to be able to access that stuff in a week. And I'm not going to remember what video or when it was shared in the video or anything like that. These are like two hour long videos. Fuck that. So awesome. Thank you guys for joining. I appreciate you guys. That's awesome. That's awesome. Two internet points. Hell yeah. Obviously the most important points that are the most tangible and, uh, valuable, um, in the world really. So, you know. Suck it, Bitcoin. <laughs> Anywho, intended player level. Uh, five level one players. Um, these are just the um, uh, the cliff notes here. So this one here where it says number of room sets. Um, because my players love nice big mega dungeons that have a lot of stuff to explore and loot, basically what I do is for every level that the players are, I add a set of 10 rooms. So it's like when they're level 20, there's going to be a mega dungeon of basically 200 rooms. And that's not to say that they're expected to do all of it or that all of it is going to be level 20 gear difficult because it like scales in difficulty with every level. So they'll like blast through early levels, but it's basically just to make it so that there's all kinds of stuff to, for them to do. Run a giga dungeon campaign sometime. I love doing mega dungeons, honestly. I really love running them. I love the fact that they kind of have to be a little game mechanic-y, you know, because like, like I say, I love, my players love to make them sort of that game mechanic, and I, and I really enjoy that, because it makes it so I don't have to, like, try and explain why the guys in the next room didn't just, like, walk into this room when they heard a commotion and people, like, you know, exploding magical bombs and shit. It can just be like, no, you're in a dungeon, this is what's in this room, deal with this room, then move on to the next room. You know, it's like, and then we handle wandering monsters if they decide to take a long rest. It's like, it's it's honestly simpler to do a Giga Dungeon. Because it's just like, it's all planned out already. But, you know, the other thing is, we ease players into it. This is a level one one. So there's only going to be one set of rooms here. Um, so it's one set. Nearest city is our Novo... Um, oops, hold on, unbold that. Unbold that. It's got to be aesthetically pleasing. Novo... Uh, Troy Cladney. And then current overlord, um, we're going to do NA. Um, I always do, if there's um, a lot of dungeons, especially later on in a campaign, there's going to be like a boss or someone who's like in charge of it, you know? Because cause when I say dungeon, it doesn't necessarily just mean like a cave or a dungeon. A dungeon can even include a city, right? And there's just different quarters of the city that they go through. I use the term dungeon very loosely. And so the overlord is just whoever's in charge of it, if it's applicable. So if they're in a city, you know, it's like, who's the king or the guard captain of the city or all that kind of stuff. You know, in this cave, there's not really going to be an overlord per se. There'll probably be a final boss in there, but it's just going to be a wild animal. So we're just going to put an NA there. It's not, it's not really a relevant thing. Um, so the history. Because this is an introductory cave, um, honestly, there's not really going to be much about this one. Um... This is just a cave. It is unblemished by um, by any tears in reality. Uh, it has no dark and twisted past. It's a place that a lot of wild animals um, will hide in during a big storm. <laughs> Lots, uh, oops, no, lots of bat guano, too. <laughs> there we go. All right, what do you got for me? Just have one campaign idea based around crystal portal tele teleported players to an instance dungeon that scale with them. Okay, yeah. In the world, the first people to fully delve all the levels would become kings of the city, inheriting it from the golden dragon that wanted to retire. That's awesome. Honestly, I love stuff like that. Um, I love campaigns. That are that really just lean heavily into the like adventure for the sake of adventure, right? It's like yeah, you want to be king, like fuck it, go do this. 
you know, it's, it's I, I think that's really fun. Um, Cause right now we're kind of in an age where a lot of the hype of D and D is like grand campaigns. And I think we can, I genuinely think we can thank critical role for that. Um, and I don't mean that as like necessarily a dig or a praise on them. It's just, you know, they, they do these big grand sweeping heroic storylines because they're all actors, writers, actresses, you know, that's what, that's what they do. And so that's how they play. And it's made for really good entertainment. And so like, that's what's really popular right now because they've, they, they've kind of, they've played a big role in the sort of growth and popularity that D and D has seen in the past, like five or 10 years. Um, um, but the fact is, is that's far from the only way to play. Um, and I, I absolutely love a game. Like, I mean, my game that I'm playing with my players, because I'm not actually using this campaign that we're building right now. This is just a fun project we're doing on the side. My campaign that I'm doing with my players right now, um, it's a pirate-themed one. And I've basically given them a Zelda Wind Waker campaign, where it's like, yeah, they got to collect up six pearls to unlock a hidden tower, and then they go to the top of the tower to find a treasure. And there's a race to get there, because there's also a dragon that's after all that shit. Go nuts! And it's like, that's what the campaign is. There's no end of the world there's no nothing like that it's just like shit man there's all kinds of stuff to find and they want to be pirates i'm like all right there's some pirates here's a here's a a treasure treasure hunt go go have fun and they fucking love it and i love leading it for them and it's a great thing in the city there'd be factions trying to recruit people in a race to win yeah for sure oh yeah yeah the sixers uh from uh ready player one for sure um yeah no i feel you i feel you so the hook in your campaign is that you're adventurers who really want to be pirates. Yeah, yeah, like that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is for my players. Like literally, my players came up to me and they're like, because they were a bunch of friends. Uh, there, there were. It was a group of friends, and I was friends with one of them. And he was like, hey, you know, we got this group of friends. It was actually really kind of them to to invite me to help them out with this, because they, one of them, I was, I knew, um, and he knew I was a DM, and I had just moved to the city that they all are in. And they were like, well, we've kind of had a passing interest. Uh, do you want to hang out with us? And then you can, you know, teach us how to do D&D. &D. And I was like, fuck yeah. And they were just like, and they were just like, they, that's, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Orange Bolt. That's 100% what it was with my group. They were just like, you know, that, with, f funny that we both had groups that did that. But yeah, they were like, yeah, we kind of, we really like playing um, uh, Sea of Thieves. Can we do a pirate campaign? And I was like, fuck yeah, we could do a pirate campaign. That sounds rad. Won't be any guns, but yeah, let's do a pirate campaign. <laughs> so you're already doing the pirate thing but being crap at it in a comedic way oh yeah oh yeah 100% Gandhi like you just described how it all goes you just described exactly what my players do because they try to be crafty and either through flubbed rolls or them just being goofballs like it doesn't succeed the biggest prize they found they found one of the pearls that they need to unlock the tower um, and the other biggest surprise they found is they killed uh, a brainwashed turtle and one of them uh, hacked off its like tail and just carries it so it's like that's <laughs> that's the success they've had as pirates so far <laughs> it's really funny it's really funny we've been playing for like a year that's like our biggest success so far no I take that back I take that back they they booby trapped a treasure chest um, to magically spray confetti and insults at, uh, at um, one of the player's mortal enemies because they found where he was hiding. And they rigged the treasure chest to like that he stored all this stuff in. They stole all the guy's crap. And then they rigged it so that when they opened up the chest, uh, it would spray out like magical foam and confetti and uh, and just like start laughing at them saying, ha ha, you're broke. <laughs> and that was, that was probably their biggest success. That was a big success. I was very proud of them. I was very proud of them. Um, but yeah, so for this one, uh, it's just a cave. No history. It's unblemished by tears in any way. It, by, by tears? Tears? I don't know. Whatever. It has no... <laughs> I'm gonna leave it. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it as this. <laughs> it has no dark and twisted past. It's a place that a lot of wild animals will hide in during a big storm. That's a back one or two. Yeah, it's just a cave. It's just a cave. Um... Because what it's going to do, because what's going to happen is they're going to be exploring it. And then conveniently, once they finish exploring it, they're going to hear a commotion outside. And when they go out to see, that's the dragon confronting this, um, this, uh, this, um, uh, expedition crew, this adventure crew that's mapping out this road. It's the dragon confronting them. And then, you know, once they're done with the level one dungeon, that's when they're thrown into it. So it's like, it gives them a chance because it's intended to be level one. 
for new players. You know, if you have completely new players, it's a chance for them to just like play the game a little bit without having to worry about understanding how to follow a plot hook, right? Because that's almost a skill in and of itself. Um, you know, that's just that's just how it goes. So you know, you need you need players need the chance to sort of get their bearing. And if you throw too much exposition at them, they're gonna have a hard time understanding what's important, what they should do about any of it. Just give them a game to play at first, and then go from there. So peace. He's tried to get a boat before it's a check. Natural twenty for it to work on the captain. Net one hundred for the check to work. Bang. <laughs> yeah, if you roll a net one hundred, that's the thing. If I don't want something to happen, I I'm the kind of guy I won't just make a high check. I'll just say like, no, you can't do that right now. And so that was my players. They're like, oh, we wanna we wanna buy a ship. I was like, okay, well the ship costs this many thousands of gold, and all of you guys have about ten gold in your pocket. And they are like, oh. Okay, well then we're gonna rent a rowboat and start doing stuff. I was like, there you go. That's uh, that's where you're at. That's the level you're at. Need a room with some owl cats in it. Why owl cats? Why do why do we need owl cats? I don't know if I'm missing something. Maybe there's like a joke there that's going over my head. I don't know. I'm not opposed to it. I just I need to know. I need to know the reason. Uh, th okay, thematic elements. Um, so this one, there's not gonna be a whole lot that we have to put here for our thematic elements. Um. Uh, because adorable. I don't know. See, that's the thing. If you put something that you really like, like adorable things, in a dungeon, you run the risk of your murder hobo players just slaughtering it, and that's sad. <laughs> you know, you got. It's a risky thing to do. It's a risky thing to do. <laughs> that's here. Uh, enemy type and theme. Um, enemies are all wild critters so it's just gonna be a cave and it's just gonna have like wild critters and stuff in there. there's nothing particularly monstrous we want to ease them into the monstrous horrors that exist in the world of D&D you know I don't want to give them I don't want to give them a damn manticore because if you've seen the 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 rules is written 5e manticore thing is the thing of nightmares I don't know about anyone else but I find that to be one of the most frightening looking things and it's like a manageable thing as early as like level two or three and it's like oh my god it's horrifying it's horrifying the way they made it I hate it anyway current boss of the dungeon uh, we're just gonna say biggest predator of all the critters in the cave I haven't really decided what critters we're gonna use yet we'll get there we'll get there treasure and reward types so I do this one that definitely plays a bigger role um, in larger dungeons that will have more floors with a lot more treasure and stuff like that. But basically, I always do like, when I say treasure and reward types, what I mean is like, this is a dungeon that's going to have, oh no, my webcam froze. Oh, beans. I don't know what to do about that. Hold up. Let me see here. Hold on. We're just going to close out of the webcam and we'll load it back up. Hold up. Hold up. Don't worry. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. Oh, great. And some people are like, it's okay to them. Hold on, shoot, yeah, now we gotta like close everything. Let's reopen the webcam here. Ah, da, da, da. Might be, oh, if it's just on your end. Hey, right, make me look like a fool. Did it not open the damn thing? God damn it. I can't believe you've done this to me. <laughs> there we go, hold up, it's coming. It's coming, oh lord, it's working on it. There we go, all right, we're back, we're back. <laughs> all right, that's okay, that's okay. It's okay. It was it was worth giving it a shot just to make sure, because I wouldn't want to deprive you of this beautiful view. I mean, come on now. <laughs> oh, the stream just froze. Oh yeah, it looks like I did have a little hiccup there. I, I had a couple frame drops. Hopefully that's not. Looks like the internet is still stable. That might have just been a hiccup from my um, VPN. It does that from time to time. No worries, no worries. I appreciate you letting me know. Honestly, it's like even more awkward when I just like keep going and I think everything is fine and then I look and I see that like the the screen capture or whatever has been frozen for like five minutes and no one said anything I'm like damn it guys you gotta say something <laughs> I can fix these things mostly um, anyway the treasure and reward types um, I usually do that it's not a super essential thing but it's for me I like to I like to just try and organize when I'm making a dungeon like is this gonna have magical items you know if it is then like I'll make a note of like what type of magical items are they gonna be like fire-based magical items are they gonna be like 
you know, healing based magical items. If there's not magical items, then what items are they going to be? Is it like going to have a lot of weapons lying around? Is it mostly going to have just lots of money lying around? Is it going to be an odd mishmash? That's kind of what I like to, that's kind of what I mean with that. Um, uh, levels like to limit utility or one use items. 100%. I actually, with my games, I am very, very stingy about giving my players magical items. Instead, what I give them is the items, like the, the materials necessary for them to craft their own magical items and enchant items. Whether they take it to a shop to get it enchanted or learn to do it themselves. Because I'm a big proponent of having characters do downtime activities. Um, so I'm much more inclined to do it that way. So they can have a more personal connection to their stuff. I don't like just handing out magical items. Um, typically speaking, what I'll do is I'll give them mostly treasure, gems, artworks, things like that. And then, like I say, materials. Um, that's usually what I like to do. That's even at later levels. I'm very stingy about magical items. Very stingy. Because I want... And this is and this is very much about... Um, this is very much something that you should talk over with your players. Because some players are going to want a magical item heavy game. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I like a more Lord of the Rings feel to my campaigns. Where it's like, magic feels like a very wondrous awe-inspiring thing you know i don't like magic to just be like oh a fire wand i've got like seven of those in my back pocket you know like i don't like doing that i like magic items so like when my players get those i want them to be like oh shit this thing is awesome and like have them just be very excited about it and like almost like fight over who gets to have it right i really like i like that to just be a more wondrous thing so it's like i might put one magic item in an entire dungeon once we get to the double digits where there's going to be like 10 layers to a dungeon. That's my prefer. That's my preferred way to do it. Mid to low magic settings yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, and it really is an entirely personalized thing based on the group. Because some groups really, they, some groups just want to be drowning in magical items. And to me as a DM, I would say, okay, then be prepared to deal with a, you know, a Tarrasque at level 7. Like, if I'm going to give you guys all kinds of like, Wand of Infinite Fireball or some shit like that. It's like, okay, fine. You're just going to have to face tougher things. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Because then it just makes it feel super epic and they feel badasses sooner. You know, it's, that's great. That's fine. Um, but if I'm designing it, if I get my say, it's like, yeah, no, you're, you guys are, you guys, you guys found a broken stick and seven silver in that treasure chest. Go fuck yourselves. Like, that's, that's my approach to treasure. Not quite that stingy, but you know what I mean. Um, so in this one, uh, is treasure slash reward types, what I'm going to do is, uh, most treasure is second hand from various people uh, who used the cave as hideouts and didn't survive the night for some uh, reason. Because this is a very dangerous world, and there are going to be a lot of beasties and monsters in there. And the, uh, there were a lot of people, especially early on in the Unhinging, that were just sort of displaced and desperately finding any sort of shelter. So, like, the dark, uncomfortable past of my world is that they would be, you know, like, a cave like this would probably have a lot of people who are running from a monster, try and hide in it, and then get themselves eaten. So there's going to be mostly, like, you know, a ring, a locket here and there, you know, a couple gems, a small pouch of 20 gold. Like, that's going to be the type of treasure that's in here. And that's fine, because it's level 1. They don't need fancy stuff right now. You know, it's like, that's just... They don't need that shit. Um, let me see something here. So, okay. Uh, let's see here. The idea of materials and the items themselves. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and you and Gandhi, and you've ta tapped on exactly why I do that. I prefer my players to be able to modify their character's personalized weapons. Rather than making them every other session ditch out their, you know, super fancy plus one sword for like, you know, a, a staff of a staff of, you know, fucking magic missile or some shit like that. Like I like them to feel like they can have their character's aesthetic, and the powers and improved items that they find as they go as they go along. Um, it's your PCs love magic items, so they usually limit to high cost or, or missions because a skilled enough DM to handle toy man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's like that's always the tough part is when they want lots of magic, and because the fact is, is players always want magic, but that's why I'm stingy with it because I know they want it. So that way, it's like it feels special to them. Not a fan of cursed items. So I like 
I like items that have negative effects, but I usually avoid the concept of cursed where it's like, oh yeah, there's no way to get rid of this unless you like, you know, make a pact with the devil and, you know, sell your left nut for it. It's like, yeah, like, I'll have items that are like good benefits, but also a lot of drawbacks too. Kind of like in Borderlands when you have the one gun that is really powerful, but it lets out the really high pitched giggle and you can't move like as you're as you're using it. It's like I love items like that where it's like this item's really awesome, but also it fucking sucks. What well, you know, what do you choose? Yeah, exactly, exactly. A fighter who uses an iconic great sword is gonna be using a mall, even though it's magical. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like that's what my thought is. It's like because I've had so many players that are like, yes, I inherited my my armor from my grandfather who was a famous adventurer, um, you know, and I wanted to take up the mammal the the mantle uh, in his honor and stuff like that. And then it's like the first time they find like a plus one buckler of farting or something they're like, fuck you, grandpa, and they like use the other item. It's like it's just not fun. It's not fun. Give your party one item, less person. Like 1d4 plus 1 necrotic damage to themselves when doing a, uh, a hearing perception check and add the damage to the check total. Okay, alright, alright, yeah, see stuff like that. Like, I, lo I love that kind of stuff where there's like a cost to using it. I don't like cursed in the sense of like you can't get rid of this. I like things that are like cursed in the sense of it's irritating, but you don't want to get rid of this, right? You have to decide, like, do you want to get rid of this or do you not want to? You know, and, like, I think that makes it much more fun and exciting and interesting. Because it's really funny to see what players will choose. Like, where their limits are of, like, what type, what level of bullshit they'll deal with for an awesome power. I always think that's really fun. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Puzzle and trap themes. Same thing. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do with this is it really kind of comes down to... What it really kind of breaks down to is like, is it like, is it a natural type of trap and puzzle or is it a design thing? So it's like, are they in a specific lair where there's intentionally traps in place to make it like a, a, a mega villain, you know, Marvel superhero lair that has all kinds of trap rooms because they know there's going to be all kinds of goody two shoes trying to stop them from blowing up the world for some unfathomable reason. You know, is it going to be like that, or is it more like in this situation, the puzzles and traps and stuff, because it's a cave, they're going to be natural things. There's going to be, like, weak points in the cave, so a trap is more like, oh, yeah, as you go, there's a slight downhill here, and the rocks are very unstable, so if you're not careful with your steps, you'll fall down and slide down and, you know, probably bang yourself up, maybe, you know, maybe break a, an ankle and stuff like that. Uh, go with unnatural traps, potential cave-ins. Uh, bad floors and natural sinkholes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a cave, 100%. For a cave, 100%. Um, and, and, like, you know, when we're talking about, like, their, uh, yeah, I figured you meant natural. I figured you meant natural. Um, but yeah, like, if they're, if they're going into, like, so-and-so's evil cave of doom, then it's like, okay, yeah, they might have intentional traps like nets and stuff or spike floors and stuff like that. But for just a cave like this, it's like, yeah, like, uh, even, even with the game mechanics, I'm not gonna have it be some sort of weird James Bond, you know, saw table that if they don't get out right in the nick of time, they're gonna be sawed in half, starting with their starting with the gooch, and move it all the way up through them. It's like I'm not gonna put that in a in a natural cave, you know. And so that's kind of what the the what I'm going at with this little cliff down here. So um, puzzles and traps are naturally um, occurring uh, barriers in the cave that need to be bypassed um, so I'll do that and this last one any other atmospheric notes um, damp stinky and uncomfortable anyway, just describing the cave I don't know <laughs> so there we go so primary tasks um, this is gonna be much more essential for dungeons um, that are uh, that, that are further along where they actually have um, uh, they actually have a specific goal for this one the primary task is basically um, all I'm going to say is um, the only mission here is uh, for players to clear out the cave in the name of ensuring its uh, safety uh, 
uh, regarding the um, trade route being mapped. Um, primarily, the uh, we'll say primarily the end goal is to have every room mapped and cleared. But if players uh, decide it's clear early, don't fight it. It doesn't matter uh, really. Um, the dragon will confront the expedition crew as the players are leaving regardless. Yeah, that's like that's what the mission is here. It's a dank cave, not in a good way. That's <laughs> right. Oh yeah, this is a this is a this is a real dank cave. There's a, a weird, almost uh, almost skunky smoke that fills it. You feel an overwhelming sense of relaxation come over you uh, as you leave the cave. You have a strong hankering for flaming hot Cheetos. <laughs> They're clearing the cave. Is there anything they need to do to keep the cave clear after it's been emptied? Uh, Came in the door and selling portcullis, etc., stuff like that. Um, so that's the type of thing where. Like, if players think of it, I will absolutely yes and through it. But honestly, it's the type of thing, that's the type of thing that I would say, you know, for the sake of players, especially this early in it, I would just kind of have it be the type of thing where it's like, yeah, if they don't do it, I'm not going to sit here and punish them over that. This is a level one, this is a level one cave. Like I, like I, like I say, it's a level one cave really just intended to give players a way to use their new characters and figure out um and figure out how their um how their new characters work what their dynamic is going to be all that kind of stuff it's not this one isn't actually all that relevant to the story um so you know if they if they think to cave it in or close it in then great yeah we'll ha we'll do that and I'll facilitate that for them uh if they don't think of it I'm that this is one that I'm not gonna have come back to haunt them later on. This is just just an introductory thing to, to warm them up here. Hey Demon Knight, things are going pretty good. Things are going pretty good. Glad you like the idea. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, your dungeon theme. It's a it's a kobold grow up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. I always I always have a hard time with kobolds. Cause I really want kobolds to just be like an accepted part of society because I think it'd be really funny to watch them try and navigate a civilized world so I always like avoid just painting them as generic enemies because I like the idea of just like a bunch of kobolds because it like to me it makes me th just thinking about kobolds going through the world makes me think of like middle schoolers trying to sneak into an R-rated movie and shit like that where it's just like this like largely innocent hijinks is it, it, it's just I don't know I can't ever get rid of that vision in my head and I always like that just finished an interesting build, eh? Uh, let's see here. So villains and allies. Um, so again, main bad guy. So I always have a main bad guy and lackeys, pretty typically speaking. Um, and so, um, but in this one, it's just not really going to be relevant. So we're just going to say, um, all we're going to do here is say, uh, villains. Actually, I don't even need to bullet point it. All villains. Oops, no, I had it right the first time. Uh, all villains are just wild creatures that are grumpy about ha uh, having their cave disturbed. That's all they are. That's all they are. Let's see here. Civilized kobolds would be fantastic asset to any city. We have prime uh, civic engineers for sewer system and like, yeah, for sure, for sure, they'd be. They, I mean, they'd be a really good solution to all of, like, especially in, like, a, I feel like they'd be a really good solution in places like, um, uh, like, engineering and artificing heavy cities where it's, like, they've got, they, they've got, like, uh, um, um, like, um, industrial revolution style equipment that, like, is best served by small, tiny hands and tiny people fitting into small crevices in the machinery, um, to fix things. You know, but they don't want to subject children to, like, being crushed by heavy machinery. Kobolds are a great solution for that. <laughs> it's an ar hardy armor plus 
Fighter Arcane Archer. That sounds complex. It sounds complex, Demon Knight. I, I trust you to, to know how it works. I have spent so much time as a forever DM that I really just I really just don't ha have a strong grasp on the finesse of designing specific characters anymore. <laughs> uh, allies, um, no allies really. If they need it, uh, you can offer support from a nameless NPC that's uh, wa waiting outside the cave as part of the expedition crew. There we go. <laughs> Even though lower disagree, think gnome tinkers and artificers and kobolds would be a great combo. For sure, for sure. So one of the things about my world too that I that I really um I I kind of insist upon in all of my worlds just because I think it's more fun is I always make my world a bit less confrontational, a bit more civilized between the various um between the various uh, uh, races that exist and stuff. So it's like orcs are generally part of society. And the unhinging kind of facilitates that because with everything as dangerous as it is out in the wilds, as they call it, it really does behoove everyone to just get along because they need all the strength and help within the cities that they can get. So they would love to have orcs as part of their wall guards that help you know maintain the barriers surrounding the city and stuff like that. They would love that. They would love to have, you know, giant orcs and half orcs and all of them be good muscle for keeping a trade a trade convoy safe through the wilds and stuff like that so it gives a good excuse for it but really the reason i like doing it is because i just think it's so much more fun when players have so many more options for an accepted member of society without it always devolving to either you're an accepted elf human or dwarf or everyone looks at you suspiciously and is racist towards you <clears throat> I don't particularly like role-playing racist characters. It makes me really uncomfortable. So I just kind of make up excuses for why racism isn't as common of a thing. <laughs> just my approach. Your mileage may vary. It's an odd build. Uh, low damage but high speed and AC. Hey, you know, as long as, as long as you know what the strengths and weaknesses of it are, then you can make it just about any character work, honestly. Let's see, I went with Astro Concept for Homebrew World as well. It's a cooperation between the races. It's the only way to survive in a hyper-fast growing forest world because it's half blended with Baywall. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Like, worlds that go through rapid change are, are actually pretty good for that because it's like the rapid change can still give you opportunity for that type of, like, racist conflict and stuff like that if you want to use that for pushing drama and story in your game. You know, like, if you want to have, like, some old-fashioned guy who sees a player's orc come in and is all like, you're not welcome in this store. Like, if you want to have that drama for players to navigate, you can still have it there, but with a rapidly changing world, it gives a good excuse for people to be changing their mindsets, accepting everyone, recognizing that we're stronger as a unit. Um, kind of idealistic, because it doesn't always go that way in the real world, um, but it's a beautiful ideal, and the best part about D&D is we can create our ideal worlds that are better than the real world. So... <laughs> So there we go. Okay, so, uh, so that gives us all of our sort of basic background stuff. Very easy there. Very easy to do to handle all that kind of stuff. Um, what kind of time we got? We got 20 minutes. Yeah, we can still do a bit more stuff. So now on to the map details here. Um, oh wait, what do you got? I went so far as to have rules for mixed ancestry characters. It's very wild overlap happened hundreds of years ago. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I love that kind of lore. I love talking about that, and I actually have, um, as you can see here, I have races, a tab there where I can just, it's a place basically for me to tuck notes as I come up with lore. It usually kind of happens as character, as players will make a character that I need it for, but where I'll basically just make up a, a historical lore for each race about where they come from, uh, where do they go, where they come from, Kanai Joe. Uh, no, where they, uh, where they come from within this world you know, what they, what part of this world they call home, all that kind of stuff, what their relationships are with all the other races, all that kind of stuff. Um, I absolutely love doing that kind of stuff. I, I, I live for world building. D&D, &D, uh, being a DM, it just kind of comes natural to me, mostly because of how much I love world building. I love making worlds and just and coming up with imaginary environments for players to explore. I love doing it. It's, it's my favorite. Um, so let's see here. So for... Uh, Dungeon, so so what we do here, now we're getting into the map details. Dungeon-wide notes. These could almost still kind of go up here. 
but this stuff is stuff that's used as you can see we've got our long rest um, tables and stuff like that um, and it just like this gives us our baselines to draw on as we're giving our room details right so we've got the detailed rooms um, we got our, our, our detailed rooms and we'll get to that but first we have to do sort of the stuff that's true about the dungeon as a whole which then will make it easier to fill that stuff out too honestly um, so for the skill checks I have a table that I kind of go with um, and I re and I re kind of re I, I or rather I I put that stuff in there up front so that way I always know what DC to set a skill check to and I don't have to try and make it up on the fly and I find that's really fair because a lot of times I'll tell players exactly what I pre-planned in this dungeon and it's based on their level what I pre-planned for these skill checks to be so that way it's like if they are like if they roll a 12 and I say like oh I'm sorry that's not good enough or oh I'm s or, or like uh, okay great that's good enough they don't feel like it's arbitrary right I can say like yeah okay you're gonna make one of these you know we've got our easy medium and difficult so I'll say like okay that's a pretty difficult skill check so I need you to make a check against the difficult one and if they fail then it's like okay well it's predetermined um, and it's like I don't always I, I don't always lay it out exactly that way like exactly that explicitly but having it there just makes it easier to avoid any major disagreements about that kind of stuff so um, what I've done for this one <clears throat> and I have it uh, do I have it in here no it wasn't here challenge levels is the one so we can go up to level one here easy 10 medium 11 and difficult 12 very easy it's a level one introductory dungeon um, that's uh, you know that's 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 how I've got it set up there very easy sometimes a little too easy but honestly I'd rather for a level one dungeon to be like too easy because we're just trying to get players into it and hooked on the game yeah try to send me vaguely telegraph skill checks too yeah 100% 100% it's a game it's a game not everything needs to be a competition of de deception between the DM and the players sometimes you want that deception but like once they know they're making a skill check like for me that's like okay they know there's a chance to fail so it doesn't really matter if they know what that threshold is you know once they made the decision to do it they know that this could not work out well so there's no reason to not pull back the curtain just a little bit you know that's sort of my take on it so now enemies so what I always do is I always like to come up with four tiers of enemies for a dungeon and I just stick with those so that way it's easier to think about like okay why would there be a group of X number of, of monsters all together you know when you kind of pre-organize what your enemies are then you you know what to draw on and things don't get a little too chaotic which also makes it a lot easier to handle encounters if there's only like one or two types of enemies to deal with um, and the way I organize it I call them fodder soldiers leaders and bosses um, and I kind of use that terminology just because I try to I try to think about um, I try to think about monsters as being intelligent beings I don't like them to all just like sit there and let players wail on them till they die and so I always set it up this way so it's like the main boss um, the main boss of the uh, dungeon is gonna be the smartest he's gonna be a good tactician he's gonna be really capable of giving the players a run for the money and he's gonna be the strongest enemy leaders are the ones where it's like they're not the showrunners of the dungeon but they're smart enough to kind of direct the other soldiers below them and have reasonably good uh, tactical mindsets about things they'll know when to run away that kind of stuff soldiers they're gonna be they're they're basically you know enemies that are smart enough to run unless they have orders not to and then fodder is like they exist to die you know and all of the higher-ups are pretty merciless about it you know and so I just I I, I kind of come up with that way as a reminder I, I phrase it that way as a reminder to myself like hey try and give these guys appropriate intelligence levels like if they're easy to kill fodder enemies have them be trained to just like go in and fight till they die if they're but if they're like a boss or a leader have them if they find half of their companions are dead and they're getting wailed out by two guys have them run away like I mean for goodness sake why not why not so now let's go ahead and um, well actually what we can do really quickly 
We can check our, um, again, we go to our challenge levels. I have a preset out here based on the challenge rating. And this number here is 10531. One boss, uh, it, let's like, how many of those enemies would it take to make an easy battle of just those? And even the boss, I have it so that just one boss is easy. So that way I have room in the combat encounter to add some difficulty to it. All right. And I just use, I use uh, Kabold Fight Club or now it's uh, Kabold Plus Fight Club because the original Kabold Fight Club appears to have uh, entered end of life phase, unfortunately, tragically. Um, but uh, yeah, so then it's like three of the leaders would be pretty easy for five level one players to handle. Five soldiers, ten fodders. And then we've got our CRs. So it goes uh, zero, one eighth, one fourth, and one. So I'm going to write those quick notes there so I don't have to keep going back here. Um, CR zero. CR. All right. CR one over eight. CR one over four. And then CR one. There we go. Simple as that. Simple as that. As you can see, I've spent a lot of time trying to think about the templates and how I want all this stuff to do. So that way I've got internal consistency. Um, and again, a lot of this, you're, you may, you know, your mileage may vary. You're going to want to sample it with your players, figure out what they like, what they're good at, what they want, um, and, and balance, you know, how challenging you make enemies and how you organize those enemies. You're going to want to, like, kind of experiment with it and play it and find your own way. What I've come up with and what I use here is based on what my what my strongest approach to writing is combined with what my specific players like to see out of me. Um, and so that's how I've come up with all of these. And so I stand by it as a good option, but I also stand by that it is just one option. There are a million other ways to come up with how difficult things are going to be. So everything that I'm writing here, grain of salt, your mileage may vary. Communicate with your players. Come up with your own thing. Hey, Kickstand, how's it going? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Thank you for asking. So let's see here. So for our fodder enemies, we are going to just go ahead and go to D&D &D Beyond. And we're just going to go ahead and take a look at the at the creatures that are around here. We're just going to work with beasts. Real simple. Nothing, nothing there. Nothing important there. Challenge range, zero to zero. Environment, we want to do grassland because we're working in a grassland area. So... Uh, filter our monster, monsters then there, and let's see here. Just like cats, just I uh, have them kill a bunch of cats. Building a small river in Minecraft with a bridge over it. Oh, that sounds pleasant. That sounds quite pleasant. In my house and uh, in a dead dog library. Oh, oh, that's uh, an interesting library, but it does sound like a pleasant environment. It sounds like a very pleasant environment. Well done. Um, okay, so we need to come up with some monsters here. Um, the most relevant one. Uh, based on everything, uh, <laughs> it's a cave of cats. Bring treats and pets or you die. <laughs> that or wear armor entirely out of, uh, out of carpet squares so that you don't feel the, the, the scratches as they use you as a scratching, uh, scratching post. Oh, it's a, oh, it does says, uh, say deadlock. <laughs> My bad. I misread that. <laughs> My bad. Still, so it, but that does make it sound much more pleasant. Makes it sound much more pleasant. Uh, so the, really the only relevant one here based on the type of planes that I'm doing is a hyena So we'll just make hyenas hanging out in there. Why not? Um, oops, that's not what I want. I want this one ba boom Hyenas um, Yeah, and then there what is it? it's 25 XP, right? I always put a little XP note in there just so that way it's um That just so that way I don't have to like go back and search things I can just like search in the same area for how much XP to get players when they kill them <laughs> This is easier that way. Saves time. Saves time. Cat Cave could finally make padded armor useful. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. A good, uh, for the first time ever, someone's uh, cloth lar cloth armor served a purpose. <laughs> Let's see here. Using, oh, nice, nice. Uh, a good, uh, good uh, uh, mod for Minecraft. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't play Minecraft. Um, I've been told I should, but I've just, I never really got into it. Never really got into it. Um, I prefer the, I prefer just the, I mean, pen and paper. I'm obviously not handwriting things, but I, th this is, this is usually how I do my world building. So many people would say I'd love it, um, because of the fact that I love world building, but I don't know. To me, I just like the, I like doing it this way and then just using theater of the mind to imagine stuff. 
Um, but there are some really creative people in Minecraft, and I do love looking at what people come up with in that game. Because people come up with some really cool shit. I think my favorite was the guy who made a working calculator using just, like, different switches and stuff in Minecraft. It was really awesome. Basically just used, like, switches to make a binary uh, computer and designed a calculator. It was really rad. I was really impressed by that. I don't remember how long ago I saw that. It was really sweet, though. All right, so we've got our, our CR zeros. Let's come up with our 1 8th critters. Let's see what else we got. A blood hawk. Jesus. Flying snakes. That's some classic D&D shit right there. I'm going to do poisonous snake. That seems pretty cave. That seems pretty uh, vanilla cave there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be good. That's going to be good. Oh, wait. Though, there's the 25. So what is it? 10 XP for zeros then? That must be what it is. I don't remember. Hold on. Let me just go back and check. Yeah, 10 XP. All right. I'll go forward again. All right, so poisonous snake. Sturge. Sturges are creepy as shit. D did I get a haircut? I did not get a haircut rec recently, uh, but I did neglect to style it at all today. I had the day off at work, so I just said fuck it and just let it lay flat. <laughs> so that's... uh. <laughs> so, no, it was not a haircut. Um, I got a haircut a little while ago. It was a couple weeks ago at this point in time. Um, but yeah, normally I style it and actually take care of it, but today I did not. <laughs> yeah, Sturges creep me out, though. These things are creepy as shit. Wait, hold on. No, give me the picture. Look at those fuckers. They're so nasty. It's like a mosquito meets a bat. It's like, fuck that shit. <laughs> Do not want. Unsubscribe. Okay. Um, poisonous snake. Hold on, we gotta change this, though. Da da da, poisonous snake, and that's uh, 25 XP. Ba Boom! All right, I'm gonna hurry up and finish up coming up with our monsters. And I think I'm, I think that's gonna be, uh, I think that's gonna be it for the, um, for the writing stream. We do have, we will have video game streaming coming up, um, but I'm gonna finish, uh, I'm going to finish coming up with these uh, monster boys here. So now we gotta find our quarters there. Oh, uh, looks good. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I like to think that I look passable on most days. I try to at least do that. Like, at least with, like, the finger comb, right? And not let it be too, too, I toweled off and then did nothing to my hair after my morning shower. <laughs> I like to try and avoid looking too out of control. Let's see here. Giant spiders. A giant poisonous snake. Oh, that'd be fun. Fuck him. It's like, oh, you thought a poisonous snake was bad. How about a giant one? I don't know. That's a little... That's a little, uh... Boring. Wolf or boar? I would lean towards boar, personally. Um, just because this is more... I, I want this to be a plains that more so has, like, lions and stuff in it. Um, and you don't typically actually see too many wolves, um... And lions in the same environment. Although we could do wolf and flavor it. And just like put flavor notes. And have them be like African wild dogs. Or something like that. Could always do it that way. Which would be. Uh, which would be. Um, you know okay. A little on the nose yeah. Yeah I'm assuming you mean with like the giant poison snake. Yeah a little too. <laughs> Let's do that. I don't know. I like the idea of the boar though. Because I want to try and come up with things that also might reasonably be in the same cave without just, like, killing each other. So it's like snakes, if left alone, will leave the other monsters alone. Hyenas and boars aren't really actually natural enemies unless they're fighting over some sort of food source. But, like, hyenas being scavengers wouldn't really be that concerned about living boars. So we could reasonably have some living boars in this cave. So we'll do the boars. Uh, boar, and that should be 50 XP. Um, and then we need to come up with a challenge rating one. Da, 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 da. Let's see what kind of beast we got here. Giant eagles, giant hyena. There we go. Yeah, again, we just do all the giant ones. Also, it's for players that have played before. Going with options that are a little less conventional will be refreshing for them. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's always a tough thing to kind of to kind of balance a little bit, and that's why I like to flavor things differently. You know, to try and make things um, seem a little like, you know, because you can use a stat block. Like I say, you know, you can use the stat block for wolves and then flavor it as like an African wild dog or something like that. And if you do it that way, 
it lets their imagination add that freshness without me having to like invent a stat block for something. So that's a trick that I use a lot. Um, I don't like to rely on it too heavily, um, just because it can be hard to remember and be consistent with it all the time. Uh, but it's it's definitely an option. It's definitely an option. The one thing I'm thinking though, actually, a giant hyena might not be that bad because this is the, our challenge rating one. That's supposed to be like the boss of the cave. So it's like a giant hyena actually kind of makes sense because like the biggest hyena would be in charge when there's other hyenas there. So it's like for the boss battle, they have to kill the mega massive giant hyena that's hiding in the cave, you know, enjoying the shade of it, as well as the rest of his hyena pack that's around there. So I'm actually going to go ahead and go with the giant hyena for it. So let's do giant hyena, and that'll be uh, 200 XP. Bada bing, bada boom. There we go. So now we know who our enemies are going to be. Now we know the enemies of the dungeon, and that's uh, that's good. Yeah. That gives us, that kind of finishes off all of our background information. Um, because our long rest here, you know, um, I'll have to come up with a wandering monster, a couple potential wandering monster encounters. Um, but we can do that next time. That's quick enough. You just mix and match. Because the, the, the reason that we come up with the enemies here, too, is now filling out any combats for the rest of the dungeon is just a matter of mixing and matching based on how challenging I want the combat to be. Um, and I will go over all of that in more detail uh, starting tomorrow as we uh, do more streams. Um, but for now, I think that's uh, we're going to call it for the writing stream. I do have video game streaming coming up. Uh, we're playing Mass Effect 3, um, which I absolutely adore that game. I love that game so much. Um, so I'm going to take like a 15-minute break and then come back to do video games. Um, so, so that's coming up here. Um, as far as writing goes, uh, I will be streaming tomorrow and probably streaming Thursday, but no promises on uh, uh, no promises on streaming on Thursday um, because on Friday I am heading out of town to go on a training retreat with my kickboxing uh, team. We're going to go um, up north and just kind of get away for a weekend and do all kinds of... Uh, training and stuff it's gonna be awesome but we are leaving bright and early on friday so i might need extra time on thursday to get ready for that so no promises about thursday but definitely we'll be back to stream more writing tomorrow so um so thank you to everyone who stopped by for the writing stream uh, this is a lot of really good conversations today i love it oh shit you got one other thing make a creature semi-legendary by giving it one resistance a day and legendary action and plus 20 hp oh yeah no that's a that's a good balance Let's go back. See, that's the type of shit that you should put in the Discord right there. That's like a really great tip that I bet you a lot of people would really love to to see. So like, that's the that's the type of shit that I'm talking about, man. See, you guys come up with all these great ideas. I love that shit. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take a break. Thank you so much for for stopping by. I appreciate each and every one of you. I know I see uh, Danny Larson here. I know you're gonna hang around for Mass Effect. Um, so I will see you then. Um, anyone else who wants to stick around, feel free to do that. Like I say, I'm just going to take a quick break to rest my voice a little bit, uh, and then we'll be back to play. Um, if that's not your bag, if you're just here for the for the writing, then that's totally fine. I understand. And if that's the case, then I will probably see you tomorrow. Either way, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. You guys are all rad people, and I love having you around and hanging out in my chat room. I'm, I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, as always, there's the Discord. I know a couple of you guys already got yourselves in the Discord there. Um, for anyone else who's there, if you would like... We do have a Discord, uh, trying to share all kinds of different ideas. We're getting kind of our own little network of people sharing ideas and stuff for D&D Homebrew. I love it. I love that it's there. Um, uh, other than that, yeah, I've said it all. So thank you again so much for coming by. I appreciate each and every one of you. And, uh, yeah, take care of yourselves. I'm excited to see you next time. Um, so I will see you in a little bit. I'll be back shortly. There's the end stream. Bye.